shapeshifters hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? everyone, and welcome back to the Time Shifters podcast. This is your host, Christopher, here as always with my good friend and co-host, Tom. Howdy! Tom? Hi, Tom. How have you been? Oh, it's been a peculiar couple of weeks. Uh, I'm running into old guy disease where everything on my body seems to be breaking down, so trying to put the pieces back together. <laughs> well, good luck with that. Yes, thank you. So, working on that myself, I think. <laughs> What have you been up to besides breaking your, yourself? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the breaking down has been uh, 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 mostly planning for some additional renovation at home, lots of work stuff. And then uh, um, I am one of the, the folks that has uh, taken up the mantle of watching Fallout. Oh, OK. You know, um, I know of the game. Yeah. I think I, I knew that there was a uh, a series in the works or something like that, uh, but I, I really haven't been paying that much attention to it. Yeah, no, and uh, I, I forget the release date. I think it was literally like two weeks ago. So, um, yeah, no, the Fallout series is actually proving to be incredibly enjoyable. Um, and the one actor that... Ella Purnell is playing the lead, uh, which is a character named Lucy, which if you don't not familiar with the game or anything, it won't mean a whole lot to you. But uh, um, she plays a character that has been living in the vaults um, post-apocalypse. Um, and they've been down there for 217 years. So she's the daughter of several down the line. But uh, she is now faced with a scenario where she has to venture out of the vault to go find her father and uh of course drama and um action ensues especially having it the fallout game and, and the, this show has set up a really interesting notion of kind of this pseudo american sentiment that has to be carried on by those that dwell in the vaults so that when it's safe to return to the surface America can return, which is very interesting. So, yeah, uh-huh. but it's all based off of uh, that whole 50s suburb mom's apple pie kind of America. So, it's all super crazy, innocent, and, and over the top, um, hopeful and joyful, which is fun in its retroness. And then it has it plays very interestingly when you're actually out in the world that has been destroyed and the people that are there. But then uh, another act... Sorry, is this like a alternate reality where, you know, uh, we didn't make it to the Cold War kind of thing? What it is, yeah, uh, the way the story kind of works, uh, and I'm only gauging all of this from that because I wasn't a Fallout player, but uh, essentially it's an alternate Earth in which kind of the 50s and 60s that style uh, of thing continued straight on to 2077. Oh, okay. And in 2020, in 2077, uh, the powers that be in the world have released nuclear warfare upon the planet, and gotcha. Everybody has to catch up from there. But no, uh, there's also an actor, Walter Goggins or Walton Goggins, um, who plays. What what is essentially the same character, but you get to see him over uh, a crazy span of life because he was alive before the blast, and then he's something else after. <laughs> um, which there's okay. this, a group of characters called the Ghouls, and uh, and he is one of them and the predominant one. So gotcha. Yeah, very fun, very interesting look. The retro feel mixed with this a post-apocalyptic thing is really very cool. Cool. Where's this airing? This is on Amazon Prime. 
Oh, so okay. It is you on Prime. Have access oh. to it. Yeah, I, I, I I'll check that out. Uh, yeah, no, it's one of those. Uh, I don't. I'm not. I'm never going to be that guy that says, uh, "Oh, he, he, it's not just like the video games, so it's terrible." I, I can't even get into that since I didn't play. So this has its own feel. Um, I understand it hits on some of the stuff from the game, so it, it would be a fun watch for you. Excellent. All right. Very cool. Then I def- I will definitely check that out. But up to anything else? No, that's uh, watching that and getting work done is most of my my life for that and dealing Sweet. with my injuries. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, you brought it up on the last episode, so I did go and watch Head of the Family. Yeah. I, you're right. There is I mean, the acting is a lot of fun. It is. They know what they're okay. in. The characters are a lot of fun. The acting's really good. I did feel like um, it was maybe a little longer than it needed to be. <laughs> Possibly, yes. I, I think you could have told that story in an hour, and it would have been great uh, at the hour and a half that it is, I think, or an hour and 20-something minutes. Yeah, it could have made a good, amazing tale or am- amazing stories. Yeah, yeah. At the, at, at the full feature length that it is, I felt like... <laughs> All right. If you go if you go any further, I'm gonna be really bored. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> but no, it, it was actually uh, there was many moments of fun. Let right. me put it that way. The overall, I think it was okay, but there was some really great bits in it. No, there are, and, and the dynamic between um, uh, what was his name, Milton, <laughs> Myron, M- Myron, 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 the big-headed guy. And, yes. and the the protagonist in the film, uh, who I've forgotten the character's name, but uh, yeah, I don't recall. No, but I, I, he's the down on his luck pretty boy in town. But uh, their dynamic made that that movie. I mean, yes, it, it's everything that you described, but but anytime the two of them were playing off of each other, you just like. You think you even know what's going to happen from all other bad movies like this, and then they'll put their little twist, tweak on it, and the conversation doesn't entirely go like you would have expected. Blake Adams played Lance as the character Lance, you kind of think yes, of. Lance. Yes, Lance. Yes, he was great. Um, I think uh, Jacqueline Lovell, Jacqueline Lovell as Loretta is really what made the fun. She was hilarious. Her facial expressions and the way she talked and her character, I thought was so much fun. And, and she's not hard to look at. <laughs> no, she was she was adorable. Yes, <laughs> to say the least. But yeah, no, even her character, uh, the way that you kind of get her at the beginning, the complexities that she threw into her own preservation kind of thing. Mm-hmm were kind of impressive. You weren't kind of expecting that out of that character. It was fun. Yeah, no, it was. So, yeah, I had a, I had a good time watching it overall. So, yeah, fun. I'm glad you had at least got something out of it. Yeah. I have been diving back into an old favorite of mine. Yes. I've been watching Iron Chef Japanese. <laughs> yeah. Uh, There's an entire Pluto I, TV channel to that. If you if well, you it's know. on. It's on. Yeah, it's on Freevee. Sure. So I've been watching it there, and that show is so. I was obsessed with that one back in the what, late '90s, early 2000s when it was on yeah. here in the on a uh, Food Network. Yep. Loved that show, and I. It is still so much fun. It is. The just the pageantry and the over the top. Uh, of everything about that show is just so great. He managed to get that right mix of that Japanese game show element <laughs> into a cooking show. <laughs> yeah. And there's, you know, there's a little bit of drama and then like you know, all the fanfare and you know, Chairman Kaga and his ridiculous outfits and <laughs> the, just the premise alone is, is hilarious and so much fun. I really enjoy that show. And my, uh, I was watching one, just last night and my wife 
cannot watch a lot of it because of some of the the ingredients that they pull out and have to start chopping up and everything. And this, the one I was watching was the, uh, it was going to be the 2000th dish. Okay. And the, the ingredients were revealed to be pork, bananas, okay. and soft shell turtle, which of course were alive. Oh God. <laughs> and so the, the, the ingredients rise up and there's the tank and, you know, soft shell turtle. And I go, oh, and she, my wife looks at me. She's like, after everything they've chopped up, that's what gets an awe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, not many others were coming up alive. <laughs> uh, uh, eels and fishes, but I don't know. It's a turtle. It's different. <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. <laughs> yeah. The only other thing I've been doing occasionally is I've been dipping into Star Trek Voyager. Oh, yeah? I thought I gave that show at least three seasons. I'm still in, like, first season. I don't remember almost anything. (laughs) I'm wondering if I gave it three episodes. (laughs) I don't know if it's just that because that wasn't the show that was on constant rerun and... I, I like next gen was and I just didn't watch it a lot and maybe I only saw them once and then never again but yeah usually there's some little vestige of a memory when an episode comes along like that and I'm watching these now and I'm like no idea yeah actually that was a problem mostly for like uh, DS9 and Voyager is Next Gen got got playtime like the original series got playtime. You could catch that on almost anything, and that was even after the show ended. But DS9 and Voyager didn't have that kind of uh, um, syndication. No, I wasn't sure. Like I said, it, it wasn't... Even if it did, it wasn't really the series that I was going to... Uh, kind of reach out for right uh, whereas next gen like you said if i see a next gen and i'm not doing anything oh i'm gonna stop and watch next gen mm-hmm. voyager not so much you know i'll go do something else maybe oh uh, actually <laughs> even speaking of that pluto tv did like a march madness style bracket for some of its channels and, mm-hmm. and the next gen channel came out on top <laughs> Yeah, nice. That was the one that got most of the fandom points. <laughs> Speaking of Trek, just real quick, uh, it'll be a while ago uh, by the time everyone hears this, but over the past uh, the weekend prior to us recording, uh, a man named John Trimble passed away, and that name may not mean a whole lot to anybody by just hearing the name, but he and his wife were pretty much responsible for saving Star Trek back in the 60s. I read that. NBC was going to cancel Star Trek after the second season. John and his wife caught wind of this, and they started the letter-writing campaign that convinced NBC to give Star Trek its third season. Wow. And because of that, they then had enough episodes to sell the show into syndication. Which is what then made Star Trek a thing from then on out. Yes, exactly. So as I put it in my post on the uh, Facebook page, after that, it's nearly 60 years of history. They were as responsible for Star Trek as as Lucille Ball was in helping Roddenberry get it on the air, as Roddenberry was in actually creating the show. Without this couple, this show, we would not be talking about Star Trek today. No, not at all. It it had been lost to time. Yeah, it it would be that series, that little blip. It would be a a write-up in some some book about uh, some failed sci-fi show on NBC. I actually even kind of wonder, is this the first time a letter campaign to save a show ever happened? It's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it'd be the first or not. I have to think there was probably a lot of letter campaigns and maybe in the 50s and stuff for things, but... Perhaps, but yeah, I mean, this is that's the first I've ever heard of anyone 
doing something and not only doing something to try to save their show, but succeeding in the process. Yeah. Usually networks don't cave unless you get a big enough swell and it has to be pretty big these days. And I, I love the fact that apparently he, um, you know, the, the franchise paramount, they acknowledged his importance and he and his wife would, uh, you know, they'd have him out and they'd attend lots of the galas and premieres and, and conventions and things. And that's, it's just really neat to see somebody that, you know, who is passionate about something go to that much trouble to go to the, the effort and then be recognized for it. And then to have the actual production company in the end to go, thank you yes. <laughs> for doing so. You need to be a part of this new thing we're doing. So could you come to the, I mean, they were just at the um, Picard premiere. Oh, were they? The third season. Uh, I think it was the third season Picard premiere party or something like that. Oh, that Trimble was there. That's so, very like, cool. That's, that it's awesome. Yes, no, that's a that's a good story. I love that. And and yes, no. Per, if you think about, I'm not sure how Paramount gets to exist without the presence of Star Trek. Because no matter what they make, that's kind of the engine that just keeps it all moving. Yes, yes, they've had other hits. Sure, but there's been that steady income. That Star Trek has brought them over these 60 years. I saw something online recently. I should have uh, tied it into uh, our, our, I should have shared it out to our space. But uh, somebody had like this chart of um, like sci-fi franchises by how much content is actually available. Oh, yes. I posted that on the, uh, on the Facebook. Yes, you yeah, did. It was- That's all right. It would take you about 29 days to watch all of Star Trek, everything that's ever been created of Star Trek. Yeah, and it's easily two-thirds more than Star Wars, which is the next largest. Yes, yeah, it, more than Bond, more than Star Wars. Yeah, it, that, that chart is fantastic because yeah, you just see this this little thing, little thing, little thing, and this tower. Yes. <laughs> that is and, Trek. And that is the hours of available content across all of its franchise. That's just amazing. Yeah, that's very cool. I love the fact that if you literally start and end back to back, if you watch everything, it would take you a month. Right. <laughs> that's awesome. Well... Yeah, I don't know why I didn't even remember it was you posting it because I was the one that suggested <laughs> every month is Star Trek month. <laughs> right, because I was like, what what month is going to be Trek month? February's out. We're out. With, it's got too few days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's the fun part. Is yes, you 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 consume all of February and still need a little March. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and that's just it. And that counter. Still going up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, it continues, yes. With, with not uh, really an end in sight anytime soon. No, I don't know. I guess Doctor Who would probably be the only thing that I think would pr- probably beat it. As far in the genre, anyway. It, yeah, in the genre, no. Uh, I, I'd be curious. Everyone knows Simpsons tops everybody's. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Simpsons has a lot. There's many soap opera, you know, that that have been running for decades and decades. True. So I'm I'm sure you could count that. But in within the genre, I, I think only Doctor Who might come close. Right, and even then, uh, while I know it had a a long, long, long run, I don't know if that compares against all the movie content too, and multiple series. I've, I've just looked it up here as of... I'll see where the date was for this one, where this article was written. Uh, at the time of this article that was written, uh, which is several years old. Ooh. <laughs> Let's see, the good the total won't be going up for a while. No new show slated for 2016. So this article was in 2015. Oh, my God. <laughs> but but yeah. at that time... It would only take you 21 days, 22 hours and 30 minutes. So about 22 days. So you honestly could probably only add another day, maybe. So Trek still beats it. Yeah. 
And oh, by the way, I hung a United Federation of Planets flag outside. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. <laughs> We we're, were talking about that before we recorded. I've I've said I've I've contemplated getting one of those myself for the uh, for the house, just as a way to like. Um, I feel like that's a really great way to say everything that like a, a a rainbow or ally flag would say, but be really geeky at the same time. It's funny, I I, I literally just got literally uh, one of uh, my friend's kids in the neighborhood. She was walking by the house while I was putting it up, and, and she knows me well enough. She's like, "Is that a Star Trek thing?" <laughs> um, like, you're absolutely right that it is, but I, I explained a little of it to her, and I said, "You have to understand what this means for me. The United Federation of Planets is the ultimate symbol of unity, diversity, cultural um, mixing." everything the the whole idea of peace before all um that's what it symbolizes so it's my geeky way of just saying i'm here for it all <laughs> mm-hmm. i was gonna say either ufp flag or maybe you could put like a big uh edict symbol or something yes you know on the would be would would, would work as well that that would be fun as well um i would actually like a that's what i want a yard sculpture of the edict symbol, that would be cool. Like it, like in the garden sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, no, because it, it, it even uh, at a quick glance, someone would just think it's a sundial. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be fun. I'm gonna be looking for that. Okay, don't look more for on it. that later. Make it. <laughs> I'll get my son to. There do you it. go. Absolutely. He's the artist. He is the artist. We totally get him to do it. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's go ahead and end the top of the show. Let's take a break. And we will listen to a promo for another show. And then when we get back, we are going to talk about 2006's Children of Men. tingling nerve shattering podcast featuring all your favorite monsters you won't believe your ears when you listen to monster kid radio here are your host derek m cook and his ever rotating stable of guests discuss your favorite classic and sometimes not so classic monster movies subscribe to monster kid radio through itunes or stitcher or visit MonsterKidRadio.net before the next weekly episode of Monster Kid Radio. Go through the archives for interviews with Sarah Karloff, Victoria Price, and Joel Hodgson. Listen to discussions about movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, Island of Terror, and King Kong. And don't forget convention coverage from Monster Bash and the HP Lovecraft Film Festival. Classic Monsters, Modern Talk, and the Head of Rondo Hatton. Only on Monster Kid Radio. I can't really remember when I last had any hope. And I certainly can't remember when anyone else did either. Because really, since women stopped being able to have babies, what's left to hope for? The world was stunned today by the death of Diego Ricardo, the youngest person on the planet. The youngest person on Earth was 18 years, 4 months, 20 days, 16 hours and 8 minutes old. The ultimate mystery, why are women infertile? Some say it's genetic experiments, pollution. Why do you think we can't make babies anymore? Doesn't matter. It's all over in 50 years. It's too late. Move along! Move along! Hello, Theo. Have you been? I'm sorry about the theatrics. Police have been a pain lately. I haven't seen you for nearly 20 years. I need your help. 
Not for me, a girl. We need to get her to the coast, past security checkpoints. It's hard for me to look at you. He had your eyes. So why did you come to me? I trust you. Show him. Now you know what's at stake. We have to meet the boat. What is this boat? The Human Project have sent a boat. The Human Project? Yes, the greatest minds in the world working for a new society. Your baby is the miracle the whole world has been waiting for. We will find a way to get you to the Human Project, I promise you. We're almost there, Keith. We're almost there. Children of Men is an action thriller directed and co-written by Alfonso Cuaron and was released through Universal Pictures. It is based on a 1992 novel, The Children, the Children of Men, written by P.D. James. The film stars Clive Owen and Claire Hope Ashite with Julianne Moore, Michael Caine, Excuse me if I get this wrong. Chuete Ijefor and Pam Ferris. I think that's pretty close. <laughs> seen him in a lot of stuff too, but yes, I don't know. Yes, I know. It's really name. annoying. Is I see him in a ton of things. I know him. I like him, and I feel terrible that I have such a rough time <laughs> pronouncing know. his name. I really need to hear him pronounce it somewhere in an interview or something. Yes, I need to. I I, I tried to look up. I should have. I, I looked up just pronunciations. What I should have done is tried to find an in, an interview yeah. with him where they actually announce him. So my apologies for not doing my due diligence. <laughs> it happens. This film is set in 2027, nearly two decades after the human race has become infertile. The world is in chaos after countless wars have brought on a global depression. Only the United Kingdom is holding on to anything that can be recognized as civilization. Millions of refugees have flocked to the United Kingdom, but an anti-immigrant fervor has taken hold. Immigrants are rounded up, imprisoned, or executed. Former activist turned bureaucrat Theo Farron is kidnapped by the Fishes a militant pro-immigrant rights group that is led by Farron's ex-wife, Julian. She asks that he use his influence with his cousin, a government government minister, to obtain travel papers for a young girl, an illegal, in order to get her to the coast. Farron discovers that this girl is pregnant, and getting her to the safety of something called the Human Project, a research group supposedly located in the Azores that are trying to cure the human infertility, becomes a harrowing fight for survival as Farron must protect the girl from the government and the fishes who want to use the baby as a political tool in their fight against the British government. This film is known for what seems to be several long, continuous action scenes. These were not the single takes as they appear, but cleverly edited multiple takes blended together with CGI. These techniques were important for three continuous shots, the coffee shop explosion and the opening shot, the car ambush, and the battlefield scene. The coffee shop scene was composed of two different takes over two consecutive days, and the car ambush was shot in six sections and at four different locations over one week and required five seamless digital transitions. The battlefield scene was captured in five separate takes over two locations. The effects team created over 160 of these types of effects for the film. And that is actually one of those things that really stood out for me in this film is how it was shot. Mm-hmm. I loved watching this film for these seemingly single take action scenes. Very impressive work. Well, yeah, no, because you're in the film. You're mm-hmm. you're a character. Yeah, you feel like you're a participant. Yes, no, you're. It, it's not so much that you're watching. It's more that you're it, without doing the shaky cam thing. It, it's the uh, you're side by side with these characters as they go through what they go through. Yeah, and I really like that you don't feel like you're in a video game while doing it. You just you do feel like a bystander. Mm-hmm. You just happen to be walking ahead of this person. Yeah, no, we seem to be glued to Theo at all times. 
and we're going to know everything that he does through his day. <laughs> you know, I'm not a fan of, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh like found footage and first person. Right. Um, there, that's, that's a gimmick that wears on me really quickly. Yep. And this film kind of has, it's going to be weird to, as I say this, it even sounds weirder, but it has that feel mm -hmm. without having that feel. <laughs> yeah. No, I, and, and I think that's what I was trying to describe with that is the found footage is the sense that you're there because that camera was there. It really happened all in front of it. And because that found footage is that notion. This is real. This is somebody's possession that they they took this from. Um, mm -hmm. This has that feel only from the fact that you actually feel like you're there. You're, it, it, but it's more fluid than a found footage. I I like um, when the explosion, the coffee shop explosion, mm -hmm. and after that scene ends, there's a ringing. You know, it's the oh, ringing yeah, yeah. in Theo's it's, ears. Yeah. And that ringing carries on into the next scene and then slowly fades away. I, I mean, it again, to just give you that immersion. Yes. I mean, that's that, that's more you. You aren't watching it. You were right next to him when it all happened. That ringing is mm -hmm. coming because it's your ears that are not hearing. Not not that that's what he's hearing. It's what you're hearing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it was it really, really well shot film. Yeah. It, this was a first time watch for me. Was I, it? I had not seen it. Yeah, I, I. It was one of those films that probably even as soon as it came out, it seemed like something I was going to watch someday, mm -hmm. and I just did not ever. I just never got around to it. Well, see, I, I, I'm a particular fan of Clive Owen, so this one I actually did see in the theater as well. Mm, okay. And then have watched at least one other time. I have to think that this film in the theater would be even ev an even better experience, being able to get that the, the, the sound and everything all around you. Yeah, it's a good and, immersion. And a really good, yeah. No, and, and that's how I remember it. Uh, and that's the, that's the part that makes it that much more of an, an uncomfortable film. Uh, I mean... I tell you right now, I like this film a lot. I can't love it because it is a hard watch, too. There's nothing feel good about this. Even the little hopeful part is left. Is it? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of ambiguity. On purpose. Oh, no, absolutely. No, I did appreciate that as well. I, I think I would have been very disappointed if this was this really was like a really happy, fuzzy feeling ending. No, and since the point of this story is to travel the arc with the Theo character, I mean, we are literally, I'm not kidding, we're glued to his side. Uh, every scene is his scene. So as you're going through this film um, and you're along for that ride and he's even given an, uh, a view into the hope, that, that that could be here for the world that they live in, we don't get to know because he doesn't get to know. Mm -hmm. Because he dies in the boat. And oh, spoilers. I know, but <laughs> come on. <laughs> it's, it, it's almost 20 years old. So, um, That's a good point. So at, at this stage, uh, but at any rate, yeah, no, the whole, uh, because that's what happens, it makes it, it wouldn't have felt any more right. Just because the boat showed up doesn't mean <laughs> that everything's okay. Because we don't, we won't get to know. We died with him. I don't know. Was the name of the boat mentioned earlier in the film, yes. or do we only? Was it, it okay? Was. I, I think supposed I supposed to find tomorrow. Okay, I was going to say that. So the the whole premise of the film is you know to have hope for tomorrow. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's a little, a little on, on the nose, nose maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but because the way they craft it, it it works. <laughs> yeah. No, it's fitting. I think it's de it's definitely fitting. Yeah. Right off the bat, I mean, you can't ignore 
and not discuss the anti-immigrant mm -hmm. and while it was perhaps exaggerated in this film yes it unfortunately has a very strong uh resemblance to now. attitudes <laughs> yeah. that are even going on today globally yeah, globally, uh, unfortunately. No, uh, yeah, I'm not saying there was there weren't immigrant immigration issues in uh, 2007, uh, but today, well, one, while we want to think the movie is an exaggeration, depending on where you are in the world, maybe not so much. <laughs> Very true, and there are, I think, people in positions of power. Mm -hmm. uh, in this country and also in the United Kingdom that probably would have no problem seeing immigrants treated the way that they are treated in this film. Uh, even four years ago, we were locking immigrants in cages. Well, even we, before that, unfortunately. Before that and probably still, still a bit now. But, yes, no, I'm sure it's still going on, sadly. But, yes, yeah, so we, the U.S., may not be far off of what was projected in this movie. I was watching the film, and I, was, I thought it was interesting that it is and does take place in the United Kingdom, and it didn't somehow get transferred to the United States as far as a setting. But then it occurred to me, you really couldn't do that you couldn't tell this story in the United States just because of what they needed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, you needed, you, you couldn't be like in Colorado and say, we have to get this girl to the coast. I'm like, we're going to be here a long time. Yeah, no, you'd still have to set that pretty close to your destination in the U S and well, <laughs> you, Depending on your points of view and, and the American attitude of things versus the British attitude of things, um, I'm certain, and, and it comes off that way, the bureaucracy and all that comes off somehow very British in the way that it's even handled. I mean, it's very pragmatic, um, mm -hmm. a little distanced from feeling, <laughs> but... Still that notion, we're going to take care of the British side and all the rest of you can just go away. <laughs> yes, yes, um, yes. So that's, that's fitting, but in the U.S., that would come off a whole lot different. And not better, <laughs> just <laughs> could be a lot uglier, <laughs> but... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and a lot more mix. <laughs> I like... We were a little schizophrenic as a country, so <laughs> I can only imagine what a version of this would look like posted here. I get the impression from the way, uh, from the some of the discussions in this film, that the United States really doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we definitely know New York is gone, yes. as uh, I believe his parents and uh, uh, Julian's parents mm -hmm. were in New. Or his mother and her parents were in New York. When it happened. Yes. Quote, unquote. <laughs> so, yes. Whatever it uh, was. And I think that makes a little bit of sense, too, because if you're talking about, you know, post-nuclear war, mm -hmm. let's be honest, it's going to be between the United States and someone else. Right. It, whether it be China or Russia or Korea. And there is a good chance that England could come out, not unscathed, mm -hmm. but... In the best position. There's potential there and it depends. Yeah, all, everything's circumstantial and were we... I missed it if there it was mentioned. Was there actually nuclear war? I, I don't know if there was nuclear war. I think I definitely got that impression as being sort of a, um, you know, no one explains why the uh, infer infertility has, uh, has happened. But I think there is discussion where it was just kind of like, oh, we don't know if it's this, this, or this. And, you know, is it the radiation? Is it the food? Is it the whatever? And then when we were talking about something happening in New York, obviously something big, if it's going to take out uh, both set, sets of parents. 
Right. Uh, the the only reason I, I was trying to catch up, if maybe any of that had happened, is because if you remember at the opening of the film, uh, everyone is mourning the passing of the youngest human on the planet. Yes. And, and, and he's in South America. Mm-hmm. So Okay. So there's yeah. clearly some societies, other places. Uh, the way that I kind of took it with this film and, and why I think it, if it was set in the U.S. it'd be way uglier is I picture almost a scenario where the U.S. did not take this as well and we probably broke down faster than some. So whatever happened in New York may be self-inflicted. Yeah, it's possible because I don't see anything. I mean, when you look up uh, any information of this film, there is nothing about a war. Nope. I mean, maybe that's me kind of putting my own well, uh, it, impressions. It's kind of where we sit in the thing, our thinking right now in the world that we live in. So yeah, I get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, I turned it more on the notion of that societal breakdown. Societal breakdowns, and I wouldn't have a hard time believing that the U.S. might have not handled that as well as others. No, I, I agreed. And yet there is a history of England soldiering on uh, in, 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 in adversity. Yes, no, I mean, that is in their nature. I mean, it's a, a soldiering on is just a standard for them. Yes, so. So, yes, yeah, so you can see where they would decide, oh, the whole world's going to shit. Close the borders and we'll take care of ourselves. We'll ride it out however we can. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I didn't find a whole heck of a lot as far as, um, you know, the right and wrong of the future. You know, we obviously have not had a global depression. No, thankfully. Yet. Yet. <laughs> I mean, this takes place in 2027, so we still have a few years. <laughs> we got to get through this uh, year. <laughs> it, it mentioned a uh, 2008 flu pandemic. Yes. That ap- apparently took the life of uh, Theo and uh, Julian's son. Yes. Uh, only off by about eleven years and a raw and the wrong virus. Sure. <laughs> but uh, there was. But no, the a- notion of a pandemic that hit and ravaged families. Yes, uh, it, it was definitely something I picked up. Yeah. Other than that, I mean, the 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 technology and everything was all very recognizable and suitable to the uh to the world that they live in because you figure um after the notion that in 2007 they stopped having kids Mm -hmm. um the the the, it being 20 years down the road how much would you have advanced anything right knowing that we're basically looking at our own demise the only uh, advancement is in a little bit of um, medicine and uh, mentality is the idea of self-inflicted suicide being a norm and even encouraged. Mm-hmm. And you had commercials just like uh, like you have commercials for medicines for hair loss or your uh, ED or whatever. No, you have, I forget what the name of the product yeah. But it was uh, it was effectively it delivered to your home and for a quick and easy suicide. Yeah. <laughs> no, there's a- go out on go out on your terms. <laughs> <laughs> the the only other li- little thing I saw is for whatever reason, even in their crappiest of vehicles, they all had like a heads up display. Yeah, <laughs> true. You know, it's funny. I noticed. Um, for as anti-immigrant and you know pro-British and everything, uh, one of the cars they were driving around when was definitely French. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I think there was a, <laughs> I think that the first and the primary car that we saw was a Citroen. Yeah, I believe so. The one I and I only remember because I recognize it from a Top Gear episode. Exactly. That's why I know the shape. <laughs> So, well, you know, there, there were French cars in, in England. You go with what you got. <laughs> I suppose so. I think the uh, the director actually, you know, none of the cars had badging or anything no. on them. They did modify them. He wanted them to look odd but still recognizable to modern vehicles. Yeah. It, so they, well, he, he gave them a sort of a, 
future or kind of ragtag look like you're we're making this do right almost like a uh if you see cars if you ever see any photos or videos of the 1950s automobiles that are in cuba yeah that they've just kind of frankenstein oh, yeah. and just keep slapping any part they can find that they can make fit whatever keep fits the where they can force <laughs> yes <laughs> That's what I think these cars kind of have that that look to. No, they definitely have that feel. And well, not to mention that you don't have to promote anyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You take the badging off. You don't have to pay or or ask for anything. Hmm. Uh, the acting. You were. Yeah. You said you were a fan of Clive Owen. Yes. Um. I I know he's an actor that I've seen in things. Mm-hmm. Um. I can't say. I'm trying to think. Okay, what have I seen him in for sure? And I don't know that I could pick anything out. Oh. But he is an actor. I mean, seeing him in this, I, I do like him. I thought he did a really great job. Well, if you, if you need recommendations and haven't seen it uh, and like a good uh, bank heist kind of film, mm-hmm. Inside Man. Okay. Yes. Pretty good. Uh, it, it's very good. And Clive Owen is a big part of why. So Nice. That's from a two thousand same year as this, two thousand six. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. Oh, he was in Sin City, wasn't he? He was in Sin City. He's been well. He's got a long, very long career. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Um, you know, some other the bigger names, mm-hmm. uh, like Julianne Moore and Michael Caine. Really, kind of small roles, important, yes. but small roles. Uh, surprising, considering that whenever you see this thing listed, their names are always at the kind of the top of the list. Sure. And Julian Moore probably only has ten minutes of screen time. If yeah, no, uh, no, uh, and, and I rewatching it, I had actually forgotten that she was in it because she's in it for so short of time. So, but quite the time <laughs> while she is yeah. on screen. Yeah, and that's kind of how I felt about Michael Caine. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he shows up for a few minutes towards the beginning, and then we leave the character. And I actually was thinking, that's all we're going to see him, isn't it? <laughs> and I'm going to be disappointed <laughs> that we're not going to see him again because that's a great character. That, you know, he was, Jasper was fantastic. No, Jasper um, was great. Um but happily, we do return and get to see him again. Jasper's also that, given the mate- the point of this movie and the darkness in this movie, Michael Caine's character, Jasper, is just that breath of air that you get so that you can make the next slog. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and when I say slog, I, I mean, it is an enjoyable film, but it is a dark, dark thing. Uh, commentary on, on humanity and where we might go, even when there's a sense of hope. So, yeah, maybe that's why I never got around to actually watching the film. Is I kept hearing from people that it's really dark. Yeah, and I was like, yes. I tend to when I watch a film, I I don't want to watch a film to be depressed. And while you yeah, you can appreciate the storytelling, you can appreciate the acting. But at the end, end of it all, you just don't feel good. After. No, no. And, and, and that's the thing about this. Uh, while there, it, you are left with a small glimmer sense of hope, technically you died at the end of the movie. <laughs> well, and even scattered throughout the film, there is moments where you think, all right, all is not lost. Uh, the, the really, the, I think it's a great scene when they're all in the, uh, in the apartment complex and the military, it, it's when everything's kicked off and, you know, the, the fishes are going up against the, uh, the government. There's the big battle, yeah. the baby's been born and they're trying to get down the stairs and the baby's crying and everyone just kind of like does that. Holy crap. Don't fire. And everyone is just a gog. At the scene, this baby, mm-hmm. this first baby anyone's seen in 20 years. Yep. All the soldiers, everyone is just mesmerized and stunned watching this, seeing this baby and hearing it cry as they walk through. And they, they let, you know, the people they've been kind of shooting at for the last 20 minutes just 
walk by. Mm -hmm. And in that little moment, you think, you know, those guys are having thoughts. They're, they're, there's, they're, there's hope. You know, these guys are seeing a little bit of hope. And then it all kicks off again in an instant. Yes. <laughs> but it, it's a great scene. No, it, 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 that's the scene that stands out. I, it's why I even revisit it when I revisit this film is to get to that that moment. It, it's such a good one. Mm -hmm. And then it's just as dark when they leave it. <laughs> Yeah, but unfortunately, there's also, I mean, for, for all the, the good things you see in some people, uh, you see the darker side, too. Mm. You know, you see the, the actions of some of the fishes that are determined to get this kid at any cost. Yeah. Because they, they, they see some bargaining chip in it mm -hmm. uh, for the, the, the further their cause. And whoever gets hurt in the process doesn't matter. Right. Admittedly, as I was researching the uh, reviews when we get to those, I'll, there, I came across one that really kind of hit on, uh, like, I already, we were already very tied to, to Theo throughout this. He, he's the, the reason we're there. Um, but someone in, in their review actually pointed out that... This is also just watching your own humanity unfold. When we meet Theo, he is bland, robotic, stuck in his time till that bomb goes off and it sets him in another direction now. Um, as he starts to go down that, there are moments where you actually see him kind of becoming more in touch with the world as a whole as he you can almost see his senses turn on and, and he achieves the fullness of his life and dies in, as a result. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and that, that's, that's very deep, but I get, I see it when, uh, when uh, this person described it all, it was very cool. I, and I like that there's characters that are gray. Mm hmm. You know, they're, they're not, they're not black. They're not white. They're not good. They're not evil. Uh, even, even, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, key. Mm -hmm. She just happens to be the woman that got pregnant. Right. Uh, she, is she a good person? Uh, is she a bad person? I mean, we really don't know. She seems nice. You know, she seems nice. She seems fun. She seems to care for this baby that she's had. Mm -hmm. But, but she, what was her life? You, you get the impression her life before was maybe a life of prostitution. Yes, because, I mean, she makes the comment she has no idea who this fa <laughs> the father of this baby is. Right, yeah. She, yeah she, I think she even says, I, I usually don't get their names. Right. <laughs> I think is the line she gives. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, is, is she a good person? Does she set out to save the world? Does she care whether the world is saved? Mm -hmm. No, probably not. She really just cares about her baby. Right. You know, the whole the motherhood thing kind of kicked in for her. Just as easily could have not. You know, you could definitely see in this film, in this universe, you could see a woman, oh my gosh, I'm pregnant. Oh my gosh, I had a kid. Well, I ain't dealing with that. And, you know, leaving it in a dumpster. No. That wouldn't have been outside of the realm of possibility in this world. Well, and what... I also found interesting, nice little touch is that after, she, during and after she's had the baby, she's had no experience with there being babies. Right. Because for the most part, the world hasn't had experience with there being babies. So the whole notion, she's even through observation, she has no idea what to do with this child. And, mm -hmm. and, he, and that's where Theo has to actually provide former parenting skills again right. putting it more in touch with the life that he kind of blotted out i do kind of wish that they at least showed that a little bit more because we go through you know an entire day at least of her carrying this baby around and i'm thinking has she fed it right has she tried to nurse this child 
I I have no idea whether this kid's been fed. Right. <laughs> right. No, you have to assume some of that probably did happen. It would have had to have happened. But yeah, you had the character of Miriam, uh, played by Pam Ferris, also a great character. You know, she's. Uh, but she uh, actually, her and the director, both from uh, we've seen her before in a Harry Potter film. Was was she also in the Prisoner of Azkaban? Because he directed that film. Uh, I believe that she was. Right. Yeah, and uh, he directed that. So that's the second time we've seen this director on the show. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so she she was kind of playing the, uh, if you want to call it a midwife. Yes. Um, for for Key. So yes, I. I I take it a lot of things happened off camera. Sure. But I, I guess I kind of would have, on one hand, I would have liked to have seen them, seen her try to explain to Key how to be a mom, what she needs to do to take care of this child. On the other hand, I don't want to see this film stretched into like two hours. It's already pushing an hour 40. No, so, I, well, yeah, and... Something like that, especially since she would have been forced into trying to ask Theo, given mm-hmm. <laughs> given the circumstances, um, that would have might might have gone more comedic than that. Like Jasper was as close as uh, uh, lighthearted moments as we were going to get in this film, and that would have probably right. taken him out of their tone. Yeah. Yeah. No. Very good point. Yeah. You don't want to um, lighten the mood too much and not too in the wrong often. spot. <laughs> right. Because at that moment, you're literally leading to that dramatic climactic scene right then and there. It's not mm-hmm. when you'd want to start interjecting. So, how do you feed a baby? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. It was really interesting. I. I I'm glad I finally watched it. Uh, it. It's a good one. And it's one I'll probably watch again when I just want to watch some kind of impressive cinematography. Yeah. Because regardless of what you think about the story or whether you think it's, you know, uplifting or not or whatever, it is a well-made film. Yes. No, it's beautifully shot. Great detail. Good flow. And all the acting is just on point. Which is very interesting when I get to uh, the comments from the social media yeah. on this film. What do we got there? Cameron says that it didn't hold up to the hype. Too much shaky cam and annoying, annoyingly stating the obvious with a predictable ending was his thought. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't really get the shaky cam bit from this film. I, I There's some realism. Mm-hmm. But I don't think it's really the shaky cam. No, nah, not. I don't. Not get like that. I think of. Not like I think a shaky cam. And, and while I I've never read this the uh, book that this is based off off of, I, I don't I don't know that I agree with the predictability of the end. Given how cinema usually works, that could have gone a whole lot different, and normally would. Yeah. Uh, Brenda says, ugh, it left me with a movie hangover for a couple days. <laughs> I don't know if that's a like it or, or hate it. Because <laughs> honestly, you could like this film and still be hung over from it. Right, no, I, I, I don't know that, yeah, that's the thing from her comment. I don't know if you can really get a, a gauge on, <laughs> on on how she felt about that. But the hangover part I do get. It, it is a very heavy topic in the way that it's handled. Did you... You're like, okay, <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> Friend of the show, filmmaker Monty Light, chimed in over on Twitter and says he never cared for it. Really? Yeah, unfortunate. And uh, my good, my wonderful co-host from my other podcast, Orphan Entertainment, Lydia, chimed in. She says that this movie has been on my to-watch list since it came out. Maybe this weekend? <laughs> um, I didn't get a follow-up that I know of, so I'm assuming that didn't happen. <laughs> but I will have to—I'll uh, have to see, try to get her to give it a watch and let me know what she thought of it. Yeah, no, that'd be fun to hear. So, what did the critics think of this one? That's all I've got from the social media. Like completely the other way around, 
<laughs> with, with, with one uh, uh, glaring exception. So I, I really only had to take two. They basically everybody really thought well of this film. Um, and of course, leading the charge is our friend Roger Ebert for when he was. Uh, and this is officially with uh, Chicago Sun Times. Um, he, he writes, the performances are crucial because all of these characters have so completely internalized their world that they make it palatable and themselves utterly convincing. Caron, the director, fulfills the promise of a futuristic fiction. Characters do not, do not wear strange costumes or visit the moon, and the cities are not plastic hallucinations, but look just like today, except tired and shabby. Here is certainly a world ending not with a bang, but with a whimper. And the film serves as a cautionary warning. The only thing we will have to fear in the future, we learn, is the past itself, our past, ourselves. A lot to say. I like that. And I think that's an actually really great observation that so many times we've seen films where the world ends with a bang. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always the giant natural disaster. It's it's the, the wars. This one is, we're just petering out. Yep. The human race is tired and it's going to fade. And that's that's it. Yep. Whatever caused it, we are our own extinction and not with anything dramatic. Just mm -hmm. the lack of ability to populate. Yeah, I I just, I find that premise fascinating. That you the race just simply gets tired and dies. <laughs> <laughs> I just, there's something so poetic yet disturbing and dark about it. Well, yeah, because that, that is what's dark. And, and, and there's a sense of beauty to it as well. I, I, I just love that idea. Yeah, as an idea, uh, I think they were probably a little spot on on the response to which no one is handling this well. <laughs> right. And, but yeah, that, that whole notion, what would we be like when we know the switch has been flipped and we're just waiting for the juice to run out? <laughs> to continue with the professionals, uh, again, another glowing review, but from New York Times... Uh, Manola Dargis, uh, she writes, uh, I think it's a she, uh, apologize otherwise. Uh, Children of Men may be something of a bummer, but it's the kind of glorious bummer that lifts you to the rafters, transporting you with the greatness of its filmmaking. So, yes, recognizing it's dark, but it did it well. <laughs> yes. Yes. And then to round it out, because there's got to be some hater in there. And I know it's going to shock you who it's coming from. This, this is Wall Street Journal, Joe Morgenstern. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of my favorites. He's <laughs> He writes, Joe, I don't love anything Morgenstern. Yeah, no, could be a pristine masterpiece. And I'm like, ah, you know, it, it could have been better. <laughs> uh, Bambi. Ugh. <laughs> I wish I had been the one that got shot. Uh, <laughs> Princess Boar, more like. <laughs> anyway, our friend Mr. Morgenstern uh, writes, bloated adaptation of P.D. James' thoughtful, compact novel. That's it. That's what I got. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. Couldn't get to the rest of the article. It had to have been a treat. But... <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that man will hate on everything. So, I wonder if he actually read it. <laughs> <laughs> right you, now, you gotta wonder. <laughs> he just looked it up and saw. Wait, that was only two hundred and fifty pages. Can't make a <laughs> right. Can't make a film off of that. You, you're this right. Nobody's ever taken an idea and expanded upon it before. <laughs> no, no, never. Anyway, but yeah, blow down an adaptation. I don't even know necessarily what this means. I haven't read the that, but that's just sound like having a problem. Did I have a problem? I definitely get the impression that sometimes Morgan Stern is a little bit of a, a contrarian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. He heard critic and literally took it as meaning, I need to tell you what's wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Not allowed to enjoy a film. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently he doesn't. He really needs a new, no. new line of work. <laughs> All right, well, that is going to do it for Children of Men. I think so. <laughs> if you have any thoughts on this film, please send them our way. Follow the link in the show notes to all the social media sites like uh, our Discord channel, Blue Sky, Twitter, Mastodon, Facebook, etc. Uh, or send us an email, timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com. Next episode, we're going to jump back to 1975 for a film I've been wanting to watch for ages and have just, I I just haven't. I've never heard of it. (laughs) A Boy and His Dog, starring Don Johnson. This is, I think, one of Don Johnson's earliest films. Yeah, I figure he's got to be like, what, 1920? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this t- this film was was released in 1975. It is set in the year 2024, so we'll see what uh, we'll see what happened in the. Uh, <laughs> we'll see what's happening this year. Maybe we'll we'll just get to it. <laughs> yeah, we'll see what happened in the 50 years between this film's release and the and now, uh, and compare it to our now. <laughs> So that, it should be fun. I'm I'm looking forward to finally watching this movie. I'm looking forward to figuring out what the heck this movie is. <laughs> that too. It is it is 1970s uh film with a bend into sci-fi and I usually get a big kick out of those. Yeah. You know, those are those go those can go in a couple different directions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When you, when you think of some of the films that have come out in the 70s, you know, with the science fiction, with things like uh, Soylent Green mm-hmm. or Omega Man or uh, uh, what was the one with, um, oh, the spaceship with all the plants, um, Silent Running. Oh, yeah, Silent Running. All take very interesting directions. Mm-hmm. And uh, the 70s are a, a fun time for films <laughs> for me. I know that they are. So yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. It's going to be fun. So it'll be a first time watch for both of us. So that'll be awesome. Yep. All right. Well, that is going to do it, Tom. As always, thank you very much. I have had fun. Of course. Even with such a dark movie. <laughs> yes. We will talk to everyone in a couple of weeks. Until then, bye, everybody. See ya.